know that John is using Isaiah. Loud, out, out, out. Not on Isaiah or any of these. Whatever you want. Well, Passover, because if, if uh, John is coming to be the one like Moses, uh, he's the one in the Passover story. Your Jesus is going to be like Moses. Yeah. That's his point, right? Well, okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's just... I, I will go ahead. For choice, the above. Okay. <laughs> uh, you're right. Okay, there I'm right. Okay, so he's saying, he's saying because of this idea of the prophet, remember they're, they're going down to John and asking him if he is the prophet, right? They're looking for the Messiah. They really don't want to know whether John is the Messiah. So the whole prophet and John thing, or the prophet and Elijah thing, is more important to see the connection between the prophet and the Messiah. Okay? That the prophet is a prefigurement of the Messiah. The prophet will be fulfilled when the Messiah comes. Okay? So, okay, that's an idea. So, all right, maybe. What else? Alright, it's the first one. Oh, but that's not a good argument, Francis. When Isaac, when Isaac was spared, doesn't the Bible tell us that God will choose the proper victim? But where in John does it tell you to go there? There's in, look, it's, I can tell you 6,000 things about the Gospel of John in our next, what do we have? A, almost two months together still? <laughs> eight, more, eight more sessions? That's a little more reasonable sounding. Eight more sessions? You're not going to remember anything I said. The best thing I can do for you is to give you the tools so that when you go back and you read this on your own, two years from now in the chapel, you're not going to remember, you're not even probably remember my name. I, who knows? I don't know. I know I'm staying, but... Okay? You see my point? It's more important than you the tools. And so you y'all give me great ideas, but you're not telling me where in John it tells you to go to Isaiah. Or where in John it tells you to go to Genesis. Can you tell me six? What's that? No, don't look at my notes. You got cheap. No, got cheap. no, I know I was going to buy a Oh, okay. <laughs> reading the Bible in front of us. Go ahead, Annie. In, in Isaiah, it actually says, and he shall take away the sin of many. Oh, Annie? Fine, I like that Isaiah, but what about John? Turn to John. Turn to John. It says that Isaiah the prophet said in John. In okay, fine. It is 36, section 36, section John. What's 129? That's to be. Is that what you said? Yeah. Right. Behold the Lamb. Okay. The next day he saw it. What about it? Then we toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God. What? Take him away the world. And you're making a connection. Good. Is that the connection you're making? Just Did your lamp go to Isaiah? That's just, just before. It says Isaiah was talking. Isn't that the same? Yeah. Where? It's in verse uh, 23. Read it for us. He said, I have blessed one crying out in the desert with the strength of the Lord. Okay, there's our, first, there's our first one. And all of a sudden, lights ought to be going off in our head going, John is using Isaiah as a background. And I mean John the evangelist writing the text. John is using Isaiah as a background. That's a first indication. Okay? So we're going to go back and read Isaiah and see and try to learn a little bit more with the background there. And it happens that in Isaiah there is a lamb. Okay? We should section of Isaiah. What's that? We We're going there. We're going there. So, first of all, we saw that in Isaiah 23. Go uh, in, sorry, in John 1 23. Go back to Isaiah. Now, it'd be helpful if you keep your hand, John, because we're going to be going back and forth between Isaiah and John here for the next few minutes. What's that? We're in John chapter 1, verse wherever you want to choose, 23, 29, right in there. Okay? So go to Isaiah um, chapter 40. What's the key about Isaiah chapter 40? By the way, I apologize for the air conditioner. It's not working. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40. In fact, if we open the door, it's probably cooler outside than it is in here. It was freezing in the church. Oh, all right. Okay, fine. This one day we'll all suffer. 
<laughs> Look, Isaiah chapter 40 is important. If you remember back to... Hold on, pay attention, pay attention. Don't worry, you're going to get there. I, you, can, you can find Isaiah. Just flip through. You should have my little cheap marker. Okay? Anyways. You remember, with every prophet, there's two, there's two parts to the prophet. Okay? Two parts to the prophecy. <laughs> what are the two parts to every prophecy? First of all, chapter 40. Andy, out loud, come on. So they say, you're going to hell. Every prophet, you're going to hell. What else? A message of hope. If you do this, Everything's going to be okay. okay. Isaiah is the same way. In chapter 40, Isaiah introduces his book of hope. Okay? Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and, and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. What's that sound like? John. John. Yeah. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be laid low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. What does that sound like? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. I hope you've memorized your prologue by now. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And so on. But what's being, what is being spoken about here? First of all, the, the, uh, uh, the people are in exile in Babylon. And Isaiah is prophesying their return. That's why it says, make, uh, what is it? In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert a highway for our God. Because for them to go from Babylon back to the Holy Land, they've got to cross the desert. Okay? And Isaiah is prophesying this return. Um, and uh, as a side note, if you look at verse 11 there, uh, speaking of uh, verse 10, Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. John's going to use that image later on in the gospel. Okay? The, 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 that's what we were picking up in this right? The shepherd. John's going to use that in chapter 10. Can you imagine what it would have been like for John the Baptist when they came down to him and said, Who are you? And he says, I am a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Because for a Jew hearing that, that is their return from exile to the Holy Land. And those are the words they're waiting for. To be, to be freed from the shackles of Rome and oppression and of sin. And for the Messiah to come. Okay? So you can imagine what would have been in their mind as they heard that. Um, chapter 40 of Isaiah introduces to us, as we keep reading the text, we don't have time to do it right now, eventually a servant in chapter 42. In chapter 42, verse 1, this is God speaking. Chapter 42, verse 1 of Isaiah. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice, justice to the nations. Okay? So, so this idea of hope that, that Isaiah is quoting, makes straight away the Lord, finally introduces a servant, one whom God will send, and that servant will be what? Will have what character about him? Spirit will be with him. Yeah, he will be anointed. Okay? When in the Old Testament... Let me look at my notes real quick make sure I'm on the right track. Yeah, actually, turn, hold with Isaiah and go back to uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, it's after Joshua. 
Joshua comes after the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. Am I right? Sometimes it's not easy to stand up here and recite that stuff by memory. Just 1 Kings, right? 1 Samuel, for you is 1 Kings, yes. Don't get everybody confused, though. 1 Samuel, chapter 16. 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 13. Don't start reading. Let's wait. Sorry. Chapter 16, verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 13. If you're not there, just listen. Sheila, go ahead. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Okay, so he anoints him. And when he anoints him with oil, sorry, anoint with oil, what happens? What's he equal to? The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit comes upon him. Okay, for the Jews in the Old Testament, for us today, when one is anointed with oil, oil is the sign of the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the person. They are anointed. Okay? And in Hebrew, the one who is anointed is called what? The Messiah. Messiah. The Messiah. Okay? The Messiah. Jesus is not the first Messiah for the Jews. Okay? He's the culmination, ultimate Messiah. He's the ultimate king. But for the Jews, every king was the anointed Messiah. Okay? He is the one on whom the Spirit descends. And in Isaiah, we get an introduction of a servant who is anointed. He's Messiah, if you will. The Spirit of God descends upon him. Okay? And John, so far in our program, seems to be using Isaiah as a background. Okay? Turn back to John. John 1, verse 29. I, we concluded last time with a... Um, with a little diagram on the board of a particular, what's the, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, but it's a particular way of writing, style of writing, whatever. It's called inclusio, right? It's a framing. Oh, same thing, I did an A last time. And it, it's a framing device, okay? It's a way of writing that gives a certain structure to the text. And what it is, to repeat myself, is that one phrase is used, it's repeated at the end of the text, and it, get, and it makes sense out of what happens in the middle. It tells you more about what's happening in the middle, and vice versa. What happens in the middle helps you to understand what's on the outside. Just like a frame highlights a picture, right? A good frame makes a picture almost more beautiful. It reveals the picture to you. Okay. Similarly, in writing, this is the way it works. What's our inclusio? What's our frame? What's John's frame? His repetitive phrase. Behold the Lamb of God. The next day he saw Jesus, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, Anson, and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following. Okay, and so on. 
Okay, so you have your frame, and what happens in the middle of the frame? What's, what's your picture? What's the picture that is framing? You have Lamb of God in what verse? In verse 29, right? 29? No, yes. Verse 29 and verse? 36. 36. And what happens in between? Yeah, well, what's, what's going on? What's the actual, what's happening? It's the baptism, okay? But in John, the baptism has a particular character. And what's the character? What's, what is it that John sees in Jesus' baptism? The Spirit coming down. It's an anointing. Okay? It's an anointing. Jesus is said to be the Lamb. And in John, the Lamb is anointed. And in one of those three Old Testament references to lambs, the Lamb, or the servant, is anointed. Okay? Go back to Isaiah with me real quick. Last time back there. Isaiah 53. Okay, I should go uh, 52 verse 13. 52 verse 13. Sorry, 52 verse 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of men. And so on. Chapter 53, verse 4. Chapter 53, verse 4. Surely, this is the servant, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Again, back, don't turn to John, but what reference is that in John? The Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He has borne our griefs. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb. That is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears, he opened on his mouth. So this servant is a lamb. He is, and he is anointed. He bears our griefs. Okay. So all of these Old Testament references go pointing to Isaiah. Okay. Let's look at one more real quick in Isaiah chapter 11 as a background for Isaiah, and we'll leave it behind us. I recommend you go back and read all of Isaiah if you hope. 11, chapter 1. Or chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Okay, this is before the whole text we just read, right? And we turn it, find out, we learn more. He's going to be the Lamb who is anointed. Okay? And the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear, in the fear of the Lord. Okay? And so on. From the stump of Jesse, a shoot shall come forth. Who's Jesse? Yeah. Okay, David's father. So there's this whole background. And who's David? He's the king. He's the anointed one. So there's this whole background to the text that's going on there. And we've got to be familiar with it. Okay, finally. Does this discount the other two lambs of God in the Old Testament? Does, this, does it mean that John doesn't use those as his background at all? No, not at all. In fact, in the baptism, the crossing of the water, okay, 
Jesus takes us from death to life. Because in baptism, the sinful man dies and man is restored, is reborn out of the waters. So you'd very much say that in Christ's baptism, he is our Passover lamb, taking us from death to life. That's what the Passover lamb did. Okay? So, all three of them are a good background to have that. But definitely, John is using Isaiah. And with that key, it's helpful to go back and read the whole text to study Isaiah intently as a background to this whole section and to the whole Gospel of John. Okay? Any questions so far? No. Okay. One general note, not necessarily relating to John, but relating to Jesus' baptism. Okay? The two parts of baptism are what? Just like the two parts of the prophecy. Okay. No. Death in the waters and rebirth, right? Death and life. Okay, the sinful man dies in the waters. Why does Jesus go down into the waters if he is not a sinful man? If he is like us in all things except sin, as St. Paul says. Why does Jesus go down into that symbolic tomb? What's that? Because he carries our sins. He does, yes. And what does he do with our sins? He puts them to death. That's one thing. Yes, that's true. What else? What else? He has no need in his human nature to descend into death. Okay, so why is Jesus baptized? You could, you could similarly say right in the same sentence, why does Jesus die? Why is Jesus buried? He has no need of it. That is an aspect of it to show his love, yes. Okay? But there's another reason, a fuller reason. And the fathers tell us a few things. First of all, when Jesus goes down into the waters of death, when he goes down into the tomb, who does he meet there? Before he meets, before he meets man, who does he meet? Who does he confront? Yeah, the devil. So the church fathers say that Christ descended into the waters of the Jordan in order to chain the devil. So that now man can enter into the water and be unharmed. We can come forth from the waters like Israel coming forth from the Red Sea. Alive in the life of God. Okay? Second of all, whatever God touches... God makes holy and a place for man to become holy. Right? As we're going to see soon, <clears throat> Jesus goes to a wedding feast. He touches the marriage, and marriage becomes a sacrament. It becomes a portal through which God communicates his life to us. He touches water, and it becomes a place for life to be given to man. He touches bread, and it becomes a place for man to receive the life of God. Whatever Jesus touches, as God becomes holy for us in a place of our salvation. Okay? And thirdly, finally, he meets each one of us who have been baptized into him, waiting as those men stand on the edge of the Jordan, waiting for the resurrected Lord to take us forth from the tomb, to bestow life upon us. Okay? So he descends into the tomb and into the Jordan River to meet each one of us at our baptism forever. All the people being baptized are baptized into this moment, into this place where Christ pulls us forth from the tomb. And literally, he takes our human nature, goes down to the tomb, and then walks it out, takes it out of the tomb in himself. And whatever we see Jesus doing now becomes possible for man to do because a man has done it, the man Jesus Christ. Okay? All right. Let's move on. Go back to John. Got there already. Verse 35. Dave, you want to read that for us? Sorry, Dave. Dave didn't bring his Bible with him. Come on, Dave. Do you know where we're at? No, I'm just kidding. Peter, go ahead. Sorry, I want chapter 1, verse 35. Trust me, we haven't gotten out of chapter 1, and we're not probably going to. No, we're going to today. Go. The next day. The next day, again, John stood and two of his disciples. And behold, Jesus walking, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. 
And Jesus, turning and seeing them, following him, said to them, What do you see? Who said to them, Who said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where do you dwell? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he abode, and they stayed with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. What time is it? Four in the afternoon. Yeah, about four in the afternoon. So you guys are good with this. I feel like somebody asked me a question. But I don't know why some of you were like really good at that. Anyways. Yeah, about four in the afternoon. Now, we talked about John writing on two levels. Okay? And we're going to bring that back now, and it's going to be primary for us the rest of the way. Okay, what were those two levels? The level of? He writes on the level of the supernatural. And the natural. The natural. Okay, what are, what are two other ways you can understand that? The spirit and the flesh. The flesh. Okay. Um, grace, the law. Okay, that grace upon grace, right? Okay, we can also say creation. We, we can do creation and law. Okay, John's going to write on these two levels. He's going to he's going to take the law and he's going to enliven it with creation imagery. He's going to bring it to life. Similarly, he's going to take the natural, he's going to make it what it was supposed to be. He's going to take the flesh, and he's going to imbue it with the spirit. Okay, he's going to lift all of this up. And what we're going to find in John is most people that meet Christ don't understand him. And they're stuck on this level of the natural. And Jesus is always speaking and communicating on the level of the supernatural. Okay? When John says... First of all, two disciples followed him. Two disciples of whom? John. Of John the Baptist, right? So say they hear him. John the Baptist says, I saw the Spirit descend. In other words, go after this guy. Leave me. Go. And they follow him. There are two disciples. Who are they? Andrew and John. Andrew and who else? How do you know it's John? First of all, verse. Uh, where do we see Andrew? Yeah, in verse 40. One of the two men who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Okay, so Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was a follower of John the Baptist. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. The other disciple is not mentioned. Andy, why do you say it's John? John who? Um, John the Baptist or John the Evangelist? John the Evangelist. John the Evangelist, why? Yeah, tradition, tradition is that that's John the Baptist, John the Evangelist. And he always leaves him his name out of the picture through the whole gospel. Whenever you get this vague person standing about, it's always John the Evangelist standing there. He gives these little insights about what's going on. Okay, so so they come to him and what do they ask? All right, yeah. Where do you live? I think it's better. Where do you abide? Where are you staying? That we may come and see. Let's read that text again. Verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What do you seek? Okay? What do you think Jesus is asking them? Like, do you think he's asking about his earthly home, about where he's staying? What, what are you trying to find? What are you looking for? Okay? John's writing on two levels. And those, and the natural level is simply, you know, what are you looking for? Okay? And a deeper level is what are you seeking in your soul? What are you looking for? What do you want from me? And what do they say? Where are you staying? Where are you staying? Again, where do you abide? Where is your home to be found? Okay? Are they asking him, where on the banks of the Jordan are you camping out? Or what house are you staying at tonight? No. no. Okay, there's something more, something deeper that they're seeking. And he says to them, come and see. And again, they Christ say, come, come check out. Let me show you my pad that I got over here. With my, with, not at all. Come and see. And in John, remember, back in the prologue, seeing is very important. Okay? 
Jesus is the one that sees the Father. And we're coming to see His glory. Sight in the Gospel of John is extremely important. Come and see. Come and behold. Because when we behold something, what happens to us? Becomes part of us, right? Our sight is a parallel with our knowledge. What we see and what we know. What we see, I now can close my eyes and I have it within me. Okay? Similarly in John, come and see. And if they look and they see, something's going to begin to happen to them. Okay? They came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. Verse 40. Go ahead, Anson. Sorry. Um... One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Okay, now, we usually read the text just like Anson did. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, Anson's a good friend of mine, so I should be fun. <laughs> Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Anderson. He first found his brother Simon and said, and said to him, Hey, I found the Messiah. Come on, come check it out. What does Messiah mean? Anointed. And who is the anointed one? The Christ. The Christ. Okay, fine. Give me it in English. We're going to be over this a hundred times. We keep putting things into other languages. Put it in the English. King. He is the king. I just found the king. I just found the Messiah prophesied in the entire Old Testament. Do you think Andrew's like, you know, <laughs> first of all, he's just committed treason. By those very words, he could be killed. Okay? So the intensity of the situation shouldn't be, it shouldn't be taken lightly. He has just committed a capital offense. Okay? Furthermore, this is the moment he has lived his life for. He's living out in the desert with John the Baptist. It's like on the edge of civilization, on the edge of society, he has had a complete devotion to the coming of the Messiah, and he just found him. And how does he know that Jesus is the Messiah? Because he saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him. He interprets for us what John the Evangelist is writing about in Jesus' baptism. When he says, I saw the Spirit descend upon him, Andrew interprets it for us and says, He just saw the anointing of the King of God. And here we go. Okay? He runs to his brother. Let me tell you right now, if the second coming happened... I most likely would be on the phone with my brother, and if I couldn't get him on the phone, I'd start running to Nebraska. Okay? Good luck. <laughs> Imagine what that was like for Andrew to run to his brother to go get him. I have found the Messiah. Okay? It's not, you know, the hang out, have fun type of thing. Okay? This is drop everything you have. Your life is fundamentally different from this moment on. Okay? So he comes. Peter comes. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ, which means king. He brought him to Jesus, or means anointed, which means king. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Right? Wrong. Rock. Cephas Rock. does not mean Peter. He's Rock. How do you know that? Because it says it's in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a good reason. All right, look, I'm going to give you a little uh, English lesson here. I'm really bad with this kind of thing, so bear with me. All right. We need to make a distinction. First of all, when you leave, I've got flyers back there for you, things you can read, on, a little apologetic on why Peter is the rock. Why is this important? Because some people say that Peter actually is not the rock. Okay? And we're going to deal with the, the linguistic 
background to it short, very quickly. Okay. First of all, we have to make a distinction between what's called a translation okay, and a transliteration. Okay. What is the difference between a translation and a transliteration? How many of you have ever heard of a transliteration before? Okay, some of you have. Peter, what's the difference? Transliteration just takes the letters from the other language and renders them in a new language. So you can take the Greek letters and put them in English, and that's a transliteration. Good. Layman's jargon, which is my level, you kind of take the word and you just mold it over, you push it over into the other language. Okay? Let me give you an example. Angel. What in the world does angel mean? Okay, in English, angel means messenger. It comes from the Greek angelos. Angelos. And when I translate angelos, when I translate it into what its meaning is, I come up with messenger. But when I translate, I transliterate, when I transliterate angelos, I come up with angel. I took the word and I just kind of pushed it over into the other language. Does that make sense? That's what he said in a little more highfalutin language there. <laughs> Too highfalutin for me, so I had to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Cephas in the text is the Greek transliteration of the Aramaic word kepha. Okay, or it's kepha or kephos, whatever, it's fine. Kepha. Okay? When you transliterate it, when you push it over into the into Greek, it comes out Cephas. And now in our English Bible, our wonderful translators have just decided they're going to leave it in Greek for us, except change the letters. Okay? It's hardly even a transliteration. It is kind of, okay, in English. But it's simply the same sounds, okay? That's your Greek transliteration of kepha in Aramaic. This is Aramaic, okay? You can't even read my handwriting. This is Greek, Okay? When you translate, when you give the meaning of kephas into, uh, into Greek, okay, it is Petra. <coughs> Petra. Okay? That's not very helpful, and you're still saying to yourselves, I don't know Greek. If I take kepha and I translate, translate it into English, it comes out rock. You're right. Okay? It comes out rock. The word for rock in Greek is Petra. Here's the problem. In our Bibles, we read Peter oftentimes. Because they've taken the Greek name and they've done what to it? Transliterated it. Okay? Now, is it, are you guys with me or is that confusing? I'm confused. You're with me. You're confused. Sorry. Petra becomes Peter. Here's the problem. I'm going to add a little quirk to it. It becomes even more difficult. In Aramaic and Hebrew, the word for rock, kepha, is neuter. It could be used as a name for men or women. It doesn't matter. Okay? But when you translate it into Greek and you end up with the word Petra in Greek, I don't have any Greek letters for you, it wouldn't help probably. It's a feminine word. Do you see the feminine ending? Petra. And in Greek, thank God, you can't name men with women's names with feminine names. You can't call a man Petra. It's feminine. So what are you going to do? 
volunteer. Your name. <laughs> you change the gender of it, don't you? And you put a masculine ending on it. Petros. Petros is not a word in Greek. It does not. Lithoi means pebble. We'll talk about that later. I've had this conversation with too many people. It's not Greek. What's that? It's not Greek. Well, it is. I mean, it's in Greek letters. It's Greek. But it's not a word that you can define in Greek. Okay? Um, so, when John wrote this text down... In his in his text, okay, or I should say, when we can go to Matthew, but we don't have to go to Matthew right now, okay? Um, how do I conclude this? Okay. When John, when, somebody said just Amen. Just now. <laughs> when John went and wrote his text down, he just transliterated it into Cephas, and we're getting that in our text, okay? In Matthew sixteen eighteen, which is our historic text, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. What does the text say? It says, Thou art Petros. Thou art Peter. Thou art Petros. And upon this, Petra... Rock, I will build my church. Okay? Because he's naming Peter, thou art Petros, and upon this Petra, upon this rock, in the feminine, fine, I will build my church. Okay? And so on. I'm going to leave it at that for now. Do you have any questions? So now you have the, the Peter word that company used in the Bible. What's that? The mistranslated. What I'm saying is it becomes very difficult in our Bibles because we go from Cephas to Peter to Rock. And as, as Catholics, because we don't have very good Greek background or Hebrew background, we're left going, well, I don't know whether, I mean, I got Peter in my Bible and the priest told me he's the Rock. But, you know, in the Bible it says Jesus is the Rock. And so, I mean, what am I supposed to say? Okay. Why did, why did they leave the original name Cephas in the Bible? Well, the, our translators here did. They did. They have a Cephas. Okay? And you know what? That right there proves one very important thing. And that is that back in the Hebrew, when Jesus was speaking, or in Aramaic, Jesus was speaking, he used the word kepha to name Peter. Right. Because now it's transliterated into Greek as Cephas. And so we know our Hebrew background is kepha. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. I'm confused about what you think is kepha there. I'm saying in Matthew 16, 18, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Yeah. The Greek text says, Thou art Petros, and upon this Petra I will build my church. Okay, now see the, the, the difference between Petra and Petros. Well, there, there is and there isn't. Petros is just the masculine form given as a name to a man. Yes. Okay. But Petra is supposed to be the feminine form. Petra is the feminine and form. Are using Petra there for because in the Greek text, that's what it says. Thou art Petros, and upon this Petra, upon this rock, I will build my church. And some have some have said, against Catholics, that Petros means little rock. And what Jesus is actually doing in Matthew 16, 18, we're getting way off topic, is contrasting himself, the rock, with Peter, the pebble, saying, Peter, you're just a stupid little pebble. I am the rock. Okay, I'll give you a little quick 30 second theology problem with that interpretation. Okay? Is Jesus the rock? No. Yes, he is the rock. Jesus is the rock. He is the foundation stone of the world and the foundation stone of the church. But Jesus Christ came to share his life with us. That's why he came to this world. And when he shares his life with us, we become partakers in his divine nature. And we begin to do things and be identified with Jesus Christ. That's why we're called Christians. We are Christ's. We are anointed. We are baptized into him. And therefore, we can start to do things proper only to Jesus Christ. A priest can stand at the altar and say, this is my body. This is my blood. That is proper only to Jesus Christ. But a priest can say those words. Okay? Peter is granted a participation in the body of Christ in such a way that he is the rock. Because he's participating in Jesus' rockness, if you will. 
and only because he's participating in Jesus' rockness. It's not either or, it's both and. Okay? Does that make sense? That's true when St. Paul talks about the body of Christ. One's a hand, one's a foot, one's an eye, one's a head, one's a this, one's a that. All doing the things that are proper to the body of Christ. Those are all the actions of Jesus Christ in the world, living through each one of us, baptized into him. Okay? All right. One's a transliteration in the Greek, and one's a translation in the Greek. One gives the mean, Petra is the mean in Greek. If you were to ask a Greek speaker, what's the word for rock? He would say, Petra. That's, for him, that's the mean. For us, it's, it, it's lost. Cephas is the transliteration. It's the molding over of the word, the pushing from the Hebrew or the Aramaic. Okay? If you want more, take that flyer in the back and you can read up on it. You should be familiar with that so that you can talk to people about it. It's an important point. Okay? Find Maccabees and go back 
backwards to Micah. Oh, Micah. Micah, Micah, Micah. Micah. All right, Micah chapter 5. Oh, Chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 2. Annie? Therefore, the Lord will give them up until the time when she who is to give birth to Let's go. Micah. Micah. Chapter 5. That's what it says. Verse 2. Jesus 
Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Again, that phrase, come and see. Okay? Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and he said to him, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Why did Jesus say that to him? Why? Who is an Israelite? What does it mean to be an Israelite? A son of Israel. Israel. And who is Israel? Yes, he was Jacob. You remember, we went through this. There's a reason why we went through the Old Testament. Okay? So, do you think it's important to know who Israel and Jacob is if he's saying, an Israelite in whom there is no guile? Yes. Turn back to Genesis real quick. Genesis chapter 27. Genesis 27. Genesis is the first book in your Bible. <laughs> You remember the story of Jacob and Esau, his brother, and Jacob steals the birthright? Or actually, no, no, no. Esau sells the birthright, and Jacob steals the blessing, right? Remember that. I, I still don't understand why God blessed him. We're not, not going to make commentary on Genesis right now. We're going to just look at a text, okay? Verse 34, chapter 27, verse 34 of Genesis. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came with guile, and he has taken away your blessing. Mm. Jacob is one with guile. Mm. Think that's important? Think Jesus is hinting at something? Yes. Okay, turn back to John. Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Now, we're out of time, so here's what I'm going to do for you. When does Jacob become Israel? Anybody know? When he wrestles with God. When he wrestles with God. I'll even give you the chapter to save you the time for your homework. Genesis chapter 32. Okay? In that text, something important happens to Jacob. And he's changed into another man. He becomes Israel because of an important event. Because of something that he experiences. And it's that moment when the Jacob of old, the one with guile, becomes Israel. The father of the family of God, the nation of God. Okay? It's that background in that text that John is using. And we've got to have that in our hands, in our fingertips, to understand this interesting play that happens between Nathaniel and Jesus. Okay? We're out of time. So we'll leave it at that. Next week, same time, same time.